Book of Acts, Chapter 11. The major section, The Witness Beyond Jerusalem, which commenced in Acts chapter 6 verse 1, continues and concludes in this chapter. The section, Peter preaches in the coastal towns, which commenced in Acts chapter 9 verse 32, continues and also concludes in this section. Summary of chapter 11 We should not dismiss the significance of the event described at the end of chapter 10 and here in verses 1 to 18. For those who were Gentile sinners were in the dark, living in complete hopelessness until this moment shone a bright light into their lives forever. Such historic occasions should be sources of great joy and thanksgiving for all of us who have subsequently benefited. Firstly, our praise goes to God, and then our thanks to the faithful disciples who were the vehicles God used to make it all happen. Having stayed with Cornelius for several days, no doubt explaining the gospel to a captive audience of Gentiles, Peter returned to Jerusalem to inform the church leaders there what had occurred. Initially, he met with opposition as the conservative believers were horrified that Peter had been associated closely with uncircumcised men. But after Peter had explained the full reality of what God had done, they came to realise the full truth of the gospel message and praise God for his amazing grace. The story then moves to the growing church in Antioch where God was clearly building a strong community. When the apostles and elders in Jerusalem heard of the work that was occurring in Antioch, they sent Barnabas there to verify and authenticate the work of the disciples. He found the church there to be very healthy. Barnabas then travelled to Tarsus and persuaded Saul to accompany him back to Antioch, where the two of them worked successfully for at least a year. During this time, some prophets came from Jerusalem, and one of them, Agabus, told of a severe famine that would strike the region. In response to this, the church organised collections in their region, and would have Paul and Barnabas take it to Jerusalem to ease the suffering of the poor in that area. New subsection. Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 18. Peter explains his actions. The final scene of the Cornelius narrative takes place in Jerusalem, where some of Peter's fellow Jewish Christians questioned his acceptance of the Gentiles. Peter defended his action with a detailed recounting of the events of the Gentile conversions, with an emphasis on God's leading. This section is basically a summary of chapter 10, with only a few added details. It is not surprising to note that the news of events in Caesarea had reached Jerusalem before Peter had returned to give his report, and that it focused on negative aspects, i.e. inappropriate association with Gentiles, contrary to the law, rather than the reality of God's gracious gift of bringing Gentiles into the kingdom, with equality to those who had first believed in Jesus, and who were chosen from among the people of the Old Testament promises, i.e. Jews. Verse 1. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. The apostles and the brothers do not seem to have raised objection to the inclusion of Cornelius and his fellow Gentiles. The issue was raised by the circumcised believers. Verse 2. A group of strict Jewish Christians, perhaps of a Pharisaic background, as we will see in Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15 verse 1 And then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Acts 15 verse 5 they seem to hold the position that Gentiles who wish to become Christians must first become converts to Judaism, which included circumcision and living by the ritual laws. Verse 2 So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticised him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. You went into the house of uncircumcised men. The men hearing this would have been horrified as they would consider that Peter and his colleagues had deliberately transgressed the ceremonial law, not in terms of violating Old Testament commands, 
but in the sense of not following the later customs of strict Jewish traditions about uncleanness. Although these men were believers, they had not relinquished the traditions and stipulations of their former lives that had made it necessary for Jesus to come in the first place. The Jewish traditions of purity made it virtually impossible for them to associate with Gentiles without becoming richly unclean. They adopted a holier-than-thou attitude toward Gentiles. God has said that he would remove the barriers set up by those who have opposed his work and continue to do so allowing former sinners to repent and turn to him through Jesus. On that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. Zephaniah 3 verse 11 Verse 4 Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. Peter gives a full account of what had occurred in his vision including his own shortcomings in denying the instruction by saying, Surely not, Lord. Peter was to have no hesitation about going with them, nor must he show any discrimination between Jews and Gentiles. These six brothers were more than enough, for the law stated that at least two witnesses would have been required in any trial or hearing. Verse 13 He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. A message through which you and all your household will be saved. Some think this implies that Cornelius was saved for the first time here. Others think he previously had saving faith as a Gentile God-fearer, looking forward to the Messiah, but that this meant he would experience the fullness of the new covenant salvation in Christ when he heard the gospel message and accepted Jesus as his Lord and Saviour. As Jesus had said to the woman at the well in Sychar, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. John 4 verse 22 And then to Zacchaeus in Jericho. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Luke 19 verse 9 Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. As he had come on us at the beginning refers to the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples and apostles at Pentecost, apparently meaning that these Gentile believers began to speak in tongues and praise God, giving convincing evidence that they had received the Holy Spirit in the same sense as did those at Pentecost. See also Acts 10 verses 44 to 48 and especially the comments made on 10 verse 47. The fact that the Spirit came to Cornelius and other Gentiles without them having undergone anything in relationship to the law is God's answer to the debate and settled matters as far as Peter was concerned. Verse 16 Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? By stating that God gave them the same gift indicates quite clearly that there is only one Holy Spirit and that we all, Jew and Gentile, men and women from all nations, are one in the same body of Christ. Oppose God. Here Peter used the same Greek word kolio which means withhold as in the earlier account of Cornelius' conversion in Acts chapter 10 verse 47. Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? 
They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, and the Ethiopian eunuch used the same word at the time of his conversion. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? Acts chapter 8 verse 36 As these three examples demonstrate, God was expanding the church to include Gentiles, and no one should try to prevent or stand in the way of that. Although Peter did not explicitly refer to baptism, it was probably implicit in the use of this word. Peter knew he could not refuse to allow these new believers to be baptised and thereby give outward evidence that they were full members of the church. Verse 18 When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Praise God. Although it is taken for granted today that Gentiles can become Christians, it was an astounding realisation for these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem that God had granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. We were not explicitly told that the Gentiles had repented or declared their faith in Jesus, accepting him as their personal saviour, but it is implied in the description of the Holy Spirit's work and the fact that God knows the secrets of the heart. Psalm 44 verse 21b This move was significant given the history of tension between Gentiles and Jews, especially in the light of the Maccabean War. Forgiveness and reconciliation are key themes of the Gospel message. It was also important for Peter to give a full and truthful account of all that had happened in Caesarea, to remove any potential barriers or stumbling blocks for those in his home church. Paul will later confirm that we receive the Spirit by hearing the Word, and not through works of the law. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Galatians 3 verse 2 New section Acts chapter 11 verses 19 to 30 The Church in Antioch The Jerusalem church was the centre of the Christian witness to the Gentiles in the earliest days. With the establishing of a church at Antioch and their outreach to Gentiles, the focus in Acts shifts to their congregation. The section concludes with Paul and Barnabas preparing to travel to Jerusalem with an offering from the Antioch church for the poor in Jerusalem and Judea. Verse 19 Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. The persecution in connection with Stephen recorded in Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, caused believers to be scattered and led to the spread of the word among Jews in various outlying regions. The Jews had intended to disperse and lose them, but God had decided to disperse and use them. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Psalm 110 verse 2a Phoenicia was in the area of present-day Lebanon, its primary cities being Tyre, Sidon and Ptolemais. For Christian communities in that region, we have a brief account recorded in Acts chapter 21, verses 3 to 7. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemus, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Cyprus is 100 miles or 161 kilometers off the coast of Palestine and was the home of Barnabas. The primary language of these areas was Greek, as it was for Antioch, modern-day Antakya, which in its time was the largest city in the area and capital of the Roman province of Syria, with a population of half a million or more. Only Rome and Alexandria were larger in ancient times. A regional map shows the places mentioned in this chapter. Antioch was reputed to be the third most important city in the Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria. 
It was the province of Hamath and the city of Ribla in the Old Testament. Some believe that both Luke and Theophilus were Antiochians. At Antioch, an island bearing a palace and a hippodrome stood in the middle of the Orontes River. Bridges connected the island to the main city. In the first century AD, the main city contained an aqueduct, baths, two theatres, temples to Artemis and Heracles, or Hercules, the god of Olympus and sport, the Pantheon, and the Caesarion, a basilica dedicated to the imperial cult. Prior to Paul's visit, an earthquake in 37 BC had devastated Antioch, but the Emperor Gaius, also known as Caligula, helped rebuild it. Antioch periodically hosted Olympic-style games. Its great colonnaded and marble-paved road has been sponsored in part by Herod the Great. Gaius was the adopted son of Tiberius and was Emperor of Rome from AD 37 until his assassination in Antioch in AD 41. Telling the message only to Jews. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Mark 16 verse 20 And God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Hebrews 2 verse 4 These people had not yet heard about the events of Acts chapter 10 verse 1 to Acts chapter 11 verse 18. Verse 20 Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene. They were Diaspora Jews, natives of the nearby island of Cyprus and of Cyrene, a Roman province in Libya, North Africa. There is ample archaeological evidence of Jewish inhabitants in these areas. Greeks here mean not just people from Greece, but Greek-speaking Gentiles who lived in Antioch. We have also encountered similar terms, such as Hellenists or Grecian Jews, in Acts chapter 9 verse 29, and also the term Hellenist for Greek-speaking Christians, in Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Some of the Greek-speaking Jewish Christians who settled in Antioch began witnessing to the Gentiles. Verse 21 The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The Lord's hand was with them is another reminder that this remarkable expansion of the church came about only by God's power, not by human wisdom, endeavour or skill. Verse 22 News of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When the mother church in Jerusalem heard of Antioch's witness to the Gentiles, they sent Barnabas to validate this new outreach just as they had sent Peter and John to approve the Samaritan mission in Acts chapter 8 verse 14. There are a number of reasons why Barnabas was chosen to go to Antioch. The most important would be 1. To strengthen and encourage the embryonic church as it started to grow. The name Barnabas comes from the Greek Heos Paraklesios, which some translate as son of exhortation. Therefore, he would be a natural choice for this role. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Romans 12 verse 8 2. To help establish some form of structure to enable the church to grow successfully and still be managed. 3. To ensure that the doctrine and quality of teaching was in line with that taught by Jesus. 4. To help with the teaching. Barnabas was a Levite and was thus used to serving in the Jewish synagogue and was certainly gifted in teaching, as we will see in the forthcoming chapters. What made him especially suitable was he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Verse 23. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Full of the Holy Spirit and faith. This does not describe a single experience, but a general characteristic of Barnabas' life. The persecution by Herod, recorded in Acts chapter 12 verses 1 to 19, 
and Herod's death, see Acts 12 verse 20 to 23, would have been inserted at this point in the narrative if Luke had been writing everything in exact chronological order because Herod died in AD 44, see Acts 12 verse 23. And Paul apparently stayed in Tarsus until AD 45 when Barnabas went there and brought him back to Antioch verses 25 to 26. But Luke here departs from strict chronological order because he is telling the story of the church in Antioch. He continues on this topic until verse 30 and then turns to discuss what happened to Herod at about this time. Acts 12 verse 1. Verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul and when he found him he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first as Antioch. Paul had gone to his native Tarsus after his conversion and his persecution in both Damascus and Jerusalem. Acts 9 verse 30 As a diaspora Jew, he was particularly suited for the Gentile outreach. His whole year of participation in this mission in Antioch was probably in AD 45, which prepared him and Barnabas for a much greater mission that would follow. Just as he had introduced Paul to the apostles in Jerusalem, when others were reluctant to associate with him, so Barnabas travelled along the coast to Tarsus to bring Paul out of relative obscurity to serve at Antioch for at least the next year. Just as with his years in Arabia, we are not told what Paul achieved in Tarsus, but by bringing him to Antioch through Barnabas, Jesus had set the lamp on its stand. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. Luke 8 verse 16 the fact that the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch probably reflects a label applied by the unbelieving public in Antioch and shows that the disciples were beginning to have an identity of their own, apart from other Jews. Other references to Christians come in Acts chapter 26 verse 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And in 1 Peter 4 verse 16, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Christians mean little Christs, and was first used by opposers of the faith as a derogatory term, but the disciples wore it with pride and dignity, as it associated them with their beloved Lord. So it has stuck to this day, fulfilling the scripture. The nations will see your vindication, and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. Isaiah 62 verse 2 Before that they were called followers of the way, the way of life and the Nazarene sect. Perhaps intended for the Jewish church we have. You will leave your name for my chosen ones to use in their curses. The sovereign Lord will put you to death, but to his servants he will give another name. Isaiah 65 verse 15 if we are to call ourselves Christians, then we need to ensure we do all we can to be like Jesus in every way. Alexander the Great is reported to have once said to a badly behaved soldier that bore his name to either change your name or change your manners. The Offering for Jerusalem, verses 27-30 to 30. Saul and Barnabas represented the Antioch church by conveying its offering to the Jerusalem church in a time of need. This offering may have inspired Paul for his own organising of an offering for Jerusalem some time later. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. Romans 15 verses 25 to 28. Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 1 that this second visit to Jerusalem in verse 30 took place after 14 years, presumably 14 years after his conversion, which would place this visit in either AD 45, 46 or 47. 
As discussed in chapter 9, most commentators believe that these calculations of years were not made according to modern standards of counting, which would require 14 full years, but by ancient inclusive methods in which part of a year was still counted as a year. Paul's 14 years could have been as little as a month or two from the first year, plus 12 whole years, plus a month or two from the final year, giving about 12 and a half years by modern reckoning. Likewise, the after three years of Galatians 1 verse 18 could be as little as 14 months. Verse 27. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Christian prophets are mentioned elsewhere in Acts, chapter 13 verse 1, 15 32 and 21 verse 9. Their role involved edification and encouragement as they spoke things that had been revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes such prophecies foretold the future, as Agabus did here. Verse 28. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. A severe famine. There were several famines in various parts of the Roman Empire during the reign of Claudius, AD 41-54, including several in Judea in the early years of his reign. Historians believe that this famine took place in the year AD 45 to 46 or else AD 47. Over the entire Roman world is a general prediction of the many regional famines that took place during Claudius' reign. The Holy Spirit had bestowed the gift of prophecy on Agabus and he gave due warning of a famine that would come upon the Roman Empire and did so during the reign of Claudius Tiberius Caesar. As a result, collections were made to ensure the poor in Judea were appropriately cared for. Although most New Testament prophecy is of a different nature to that of the Old Testament, we can still discern true prophets like Agabus in the same way as before. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy 18 verse 22 and but the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true Jeremiah 28 verse 9 they didn't have long to wait to test this one as the famine occurred in either AD 45 to 46 or AD 47 However, the effects were felt for longer than this as commodity and food prices remained high for several years, affecting the poor badly. But through this prophecy, the church was able to make provision to help and happy are those who are concerned for the poor. The Lord will help them when they are in trouble. Psalm 41 verse 1, Good News Bible. And in times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty but the wicked will perish. Though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Psalm 37 verses 19 to 21. Jesus also advised us to sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Luke 12 verse 33 One of their motivating forces is explained by Paul. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Galatians 6 verse 10 Of course, the Jews of the Diaspora had traditionally sent arms to the poor in Judea. One well-known proselyte was Helena of Adiabeni, wife of King Monobaz I. She was well known for providing corn for the poor Jews in Alexandria. Her son, Azates II, was also a proselyte, and he provided much-needed aid in Jerusalem. Both these people and several others became Jews due to the work of a well-known Jewish merchant, Ananias of Adiabeni, around AD 30. Dr. Robert Eisenman contends this is the same Ananias who became a follower of Jesus and ministered to Saul in Damascus. Palestine, once flowing with milk and honey, had become a barren wasteland due to their neglect of God over the generations that led to the exiles recorded in the Bible. 
The land has never recovered the status it once enjoyed when the people walked more closely with God, at least they did so from time to time. The poor have always had a special place in the gospel message, for it was to them it was first proclaimed. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Matthew chapter 11 verse 5 Prophecy was one of the many gifts given to members of the church in Antioch. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Minoan who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, Acts 13 verse 1. And Jesus had said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. John 16 verse 13 Agabus would later prophesy Paul's imprisonment. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 21 verses 10 to 11. Verse 29. The disciples each according to his ability decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. The reference to elders marks a transition in day-to-day -day leadership of the Jerusalem church. Initially we saw these duties, in terms at least of the financial offerings, being undertaken by the apostles. Acts chapter 4 verses 35 to 37, and the delegation of caring for the Greek widows to the seven in Acts chapter 6 verses 1 to 6. Paul and Barnabas would take the offerings to Jerusalem around AD 45, about ten years before Paul wrote two Corinthians after working in Ephesus for some time. This second visit to Jerusalem could have been the occasion when he had his vision in the temple. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. Acts chapter 22 verse 17. But would not have been the time he was translated into heaven. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who fourteen years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 2 as that occurred 14 years before he wrote to the Corinthians. His translation more likely occurred either during his time in Tarsus or in Arabia. Acts chapter 11 ends.